Thank you. <clears throat> we now start our meeting with a Pledge of Allegiance. If you'd join us, please. Claire, would you mind leading us in the pledge? I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United, United, United States, States of America, America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one, one nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I now declare this <coughs> Board of Claremont County Commissioners meeting open the first day of May 2019 and we'll proceed right with the scheduled agenda. Approval of regular session minutes. Board, I know you've had a draft copy of the regular session minutes from our 424-2019 meeting. Uh, do I have a motion for consideration for approval? So moved. I second the motion. It's been moved and seconded. Any further conversation or discussion? Roll call, Judy. Mr. Humphrey. Aye. Mrs. Corcoran. Yes. Mr. Painter. Yes. We will move to item C. The first thing that's on our uh, agenda here is the designation of the week of appreciation for bringing help, bringing hope, and thank you in Claremont County. And I believe that Karen Shear is here to accept this proclamation. Thanks for coming this morning. I will. Proclamation Week of Appreciation, bringing help, bringing hope. Thank you. April 29th through May the 3rd, 2019. Whereas the members of the Claremont County Opiate Task Force are committed to leading Claremont County and expressing our gratitude and appreciation to all county members working on the front lines in the fight against Ohio's opiate epidemic. And whereas the Claremont County <coughs> Mental Health and Recovery Board as the county hub for addressing the opiate epidemic will mature and reinforce, will, will nurture and reinforce county and community efforts to prevent and treat addiction, including opioids, educate youth and adults about addiction and recovery, promote family building and workforce development as a way of combating the effects of addiction on communities and encourage community engagement in efforts to address addiction, including opioids and its impact on our county. Whereas a collaboration of many county agencies, organizations, and individuals have been and are still working to build a comprehensive system of prevention, education, intervention, interdiction, treatment, and recovery for all the citizens of Claremont County. And whereas positive outcomes continue to increase in the county for those impacted by addiction, because of these efforts. And whereas through this work, Claremont County will continue to bring hope to our community and build the understanding that treatment works and people recover. Whereas the Claremont County Commissioners, in partnership with the members of the OP Task Force, Mental Health and Recovery Board, pledge our support for the individuals, family members, professionals throughout our community who are bringing help and bringing hope by working day in and day out to save lives provide treatment, assist families, and support recovery in Claremont County. Now therefore, let it be proclaimed that we, the Claremont County Board of Commissioners, do hereby proclaim the week of April 29th through May 3rd as the bringing help, bringing hope, thank you, week of appreciation in Claremont County in recognition of the many efforts that have occurred in the county to address the heroin epidemic, which have assisted many residents to achieve recovery. Karen, on behalf of the Board of Claremont County Commissioners, I ask that you accept this proclamation for this week. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you very much. And you, if you have a few words, yeah, thank you. Hi, again, I'm Karen Scherer. I'm the Executive Director of the Claremont County Mental Health and Recovery Board. And I just want to share some of the things that are going on um, in the month of May, actually, for Appreciation Week. We couldn't get it all done this week. Um, this Thursday, uh, or tomorrow, we are going to be going to the police chief's meeting and all of the police departments are going to get a plaque from the Opiate Task Force to thank them for the many things they have done in the past year to aid in these efforts. And then we will be at the fire chief's meeting on May 23rd. They will also all get plaques um, to um, honor them as well. Anybody who's not there, we will go and meet with them. Um, we are also in the process of gathering thank you videos and thank you notes from individuals in recovery who have been helped by people in this community. And uh, those notes and videos are gonna be put all together in a one video, and we are going to share that with first responders um, and other places throughout the county. Um, our big event is going to be our monthly opiate task force meeting. It's on May 9th. 
we are moving it from its usual location at the sheriff's office to the child focused training center on Eichholz Road um, because we are hoping for more people to attend and we are going to highlight all the things that have happened over the past year um, and all the agencies are going to be bringing their resources so that we can all share and make sure everyone knows what's going on. We highly recommend that people in the public attend if you really want to know what's going on, what's been happening, and uh, maybe meet some of the people who are involved in fighting um, against addiction. Um, we have postcards around the county um, advertising this, and we have been trying to advertise it on social media and such, so we are hoping um, for a really good attendance at that. In addition, the Ohio Association of County Behavioral Health Authorities, which is the statewide trade association for um, boards like mine, directors like me, um, they are going to be honoring first responders and champions of recovery at their opiate conference in June. And we were allowed uh, as a board and opiate task force to submit nominations. We have five that will be being submitted today on behalf of our county. And um, we are very hopeful at least one, if not more, will be recognized by Awakaba for the work that they have done. And then just in general, I really wanted to acknowledge how many people have really played a part in helping us to get people into treatment and achieve recovery. There's the saying that everyone knows that it takes a village to raise a child. Well, it takes a community to get people into recovery. And we are incredibly blessed in this community to have people willing to come together and work <coughs> together and to try to achieve that. For a, a period of several years, we had one of the highest death rates in the country from heroin. Um, and I'm happy to say in the last three years, those overdose death rates have gone down, number of overdoses are going down, and it's because so many people stepped up and helped out. And we would not be where we were without the first responders and everyone else who helped, starting with the commissioners on down. And we are incredibly <coughs> grateful. And it also involved even just citizens in the community. We have had so many people step up who are just kind-hearted and want to do something. And this is an amazing county. And I would be remiss with the Sheriff's Department and everyone sitting here, that Sheriff Leahy and his staff and deputies have been among the strongest supporters we have had for years. And again, I think they set a standard for the state and probably for the country, I think, for what we're able to do collectively. And I can't thank you enough for what's going on, and particularly this year. It's been a difficult year, and that has not changed anything. Uh, the dedication and the willingness to work together has not wavered, and I greatly appreciate from all of you. So. Um, again, if anybody is interested, May 9th, 2 o'clock at Child Focus Trading Center on Eichholz Road, and we hope to really celebrate everything that we have been able to accomplish. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Would you honor us with a picture? Certainly. And I would like to invite um, Amy Foley, who is a member of the Absolutely. planning committee also for our event, and does marketing for our OBA task force. So she's a very critical member. So she's here today, too. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. <laughs> we don't really make it. We have another proclamation today for National Correction Officers Week, and I understand that Correction Officer Everslake, you'll be accepting the proclamation today. Thanks for being with us today. Appreciate that. You bet. National Correction Officers Week, May 5th through 11th, 2019. <clears throat> Whereas correctional officers have the difficult and often dangerous assignment of ensuring the custody, safety, and well-being of over 600,000 inmates in our nation's prison and jail system, and whereas their position is essential to the day-to-day -day operations of these institutions, without them, it would be impossible to achieve the foremost institutional goals of security, control, and whereas they are called upon to fill simultaneously custodial, supervisory, and counseling roles, and whereas the professionalism, dedication, and courage exhibited by these officers throughout the performance of these demanding and often conflicting roles deserve the utmost respect and whereas it is appropriate that we honor the many contributions and accomplishments of these men and women who are a vital component within the criminal justice system. Now therefore we the Board of Claremont County Commissioners 
do hereby proclaim the week of May 5th through 11th, 2019 as National Correction Officer Week in Claremont County, and especially thank the correction officers of the Claremont County Jail Facility for their dedication and duty, and it's signed by the Board of Claremont County Commissioners. Correction Officer Oversley, please accept this um, proclamation for Correction Officers Week. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you have you. a few words? Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> Uh, first off, I would like to thank the county commissioners for taking their time to recognize the career of corrections officer. Every single day, corrections officers across this country put their lives on the line being, <clears throat> being surrounded by the worst of society. It is a thankless job often ignored by society because we're not seen every day. When there is news from a corrections facility, it is largely negative. No one hears about the officers dealing with the mentally handicapped, um, the one with the mentality of a young kid, uh, the one who colors pictures for the officers that are taking care of him. Uh, that, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the one that the officers allow to cry on their shoulder because he doesn't understand when he goes to court what is happening to him. All he knows is that jail is bad and he doesn't need to be there. Excuse me, I got lost. Uh, the officers that I work with, are the, they're the best at this. Um, every single day, I put this uniform on and I work with them and I entrust them with my life. And, th and, and they entrust me with the same. Uh, I would also like to thank Sheriff Leahy for his support of corrections, uh, doing everything he can for our safety and understanding the complications that are placed upon us more and more every single day. Uh, the sheriff engages with his staff, with me in particular being the union president, and he addresses any concerns that we have, no matter how small or how big they are, and that's greatly appreciated by us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Honor certification. Do you want to bring the rest of you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Corrections officer. You have those you'd like to have up here today? And sheriff, correction officer. <laughs> I need a stool. And in her clothes. I'm okay. around. You you don't need a picture to do that. <laughs> We'll move to item D of the agenda for a presentation by Patrick Monger, the county engineer, for the use of funds from the motor vehicle gas tax fund, as well as the additional $5 motor vehicle license tax enacted solely for Claremont County Road Improvement Program. Pat, podium is yours. All right. Thank you. Well, what we need to do to activate uh, the system here. Oh, it's not. No, no. Try touching it. B. B. B for boy okay, or black. Again, huh? You got it. Yeah, B for boy or black. Begin. All righty. Well, good morning. Um, so here today to uh, give an update on our, our registration, uh, permissive fees, and gas tax. There's been some <coughs> recent activity. Um, last summer or this past summer the board uh, as you know passed the uh, uh, five dollar permissive fee and then most recently the state of Ohio uh, increased the gas tax um, and so I want to talk a little bit about um, 
that whole situation and uh, uh, try to update and educate um, a little bit on some of the specifics because uh, these revenue sources are uh, uh, pretty unique in the sense that statutorily they are uh, regulated back for roads and bridges um, to the specific counties. Uh, so I'm going to got an update here. I also have some key, a uh, few key members of my staff here in case there's really, really, really hard question. Um, they can help me out. Um, so we'll start off with the two, uh, the two revenue are my primary revenue sources. And um, I guess there's, there's two kind of fundamental things that, that I want to talk about. And um, they, they may be, in my, in my opinion, these are the understandings, the perceptions from the general public relative to um, transportation funding. So I think the first thing that I will agree with and I think most of us would agree with is that the uh, that transportation funding is an essential and uh, function of the government in other words part of our taxes that are being collected uh, statewide countywide whatever the case may be that the assumption out there is that some of that is then being um, distributed and allocated for roads and bridges so so funding the government funding transportation is an essential function of the government. I think we can agree with that. The second part of that equation, that the adequate amount of funding is being distributed um, for that task, uh, is where I think the disconnect is happening. And um, I don't, you know, in this particular case, most people probably don't realize, they just assume, maybe the assumption is, is that they, they pay X amount of dollars, whether it's income tax or property tax, and that is all going to the government, whether it's going to the state or whether it's going to the federal government, whatever the case may be. So that's a reasonable assumption because they know they write those checks and they pay those amount of money. But the problem is, is that in this particular case, that these are the only two sources that fund transportation, roads and bridges in, in Ohio, four counties. These and these only are, are it. So license fees, which represent 70% of my revenue, and in the Ohio, not the state, not the federal, but the Ohio gas tax, which represents about 30% of my revenue. So the takeaway here is it's, there's no property tax, there's no income tax. I'm not saying that the folks aren't, you know, paying taxes, but the amount of money that's being attributed back to roads and bridges are solely from those two sources. So we may agree that this doesn't work, which I think we'll see in the future slides that this, this, this way of me mechanism is problematic and there's, it's been, there's been problems with it, um, but this is what we have and this is what we have to work with. So again, a little bit of background on Ohio's gas tax. Um, the way that that is, is it's collected statewide and it's distributed evenly amongst all 88 counties. So every county engineer gets an equal share from that revenue source Historically, we go back to 05 was the last time we saw it increased, and that's when it was moved from 26 cents to 28 cents. Uh, unfortunately, um, you see this reoccurring theme here is that there was no adjustment for inflation or any kind of cost of living or any kind of cost indexing for, uh, in our particular case, for the inherent thing that we do, which is road construction. Um, those costs of goods and services are certainly going to go up over that 13 going on 14 years. Um, and so we have uh, currently, recently Ohio's gas tax was increased 10.5 cents, brought it to 38 and a half cents. Again, um, while we, that's, that's greatly appreciated, uh, it was a significant amount of time from 05 to, to, to 2019 uh, in between those um, adjustments. And again, no adjustment for inflation or any kind of cost of living or cost adjustment for goods and services. Uh, similarly, the registration fees, um, they're, you know, they're collected. Um, similarly, the, the last adjustment was uh, prior, prior to the adjustment that was made in, in, in uh, 18 last year, has, you have to go all the way back to 01. Um, and so I will say this is where 
unlike Ohio where it's divided evenly, the, we keep all of these fees. So if a registration is made in Claremont County, then those fees go and stay in the county. I think you had- Just for those sure. that are watching today, yep. uh, when you talk about that gasoline tax, just go over just a little bit of how that is actually distributed throughout the state of Ohio. Um, again, it's collected statewide, so that 28 cents is collected statewide, and it, the, the pie chart for the dis overall distribution is, is quite complicated, um, but a percentage of that overall 28 cents, which was in the billions of dollars, one, almost $2 billion, 200 million, and this was, this was a 17 number, so around 200 million was allocated back to the county, i.e. the county engineers, and so that 200 million was divided 88 ways. So it was around $2.3 million uh, for uh, 17 and 18. And but so- Because I believe there's yep. a perception there that based on census, based on per capita, based on how big your county is, Correct. is that you get more or Correct. less money. And so the Ohio- so The smallest county gets the same Correct. amount as the largest county. And we're 14th largest, so we're up near the top. And right, Correct. have more roads than most. Okay. So the, while the Ohio gas tax is kind of an even, equal distribution when it comes to that allocation for Ohio's, you know, there's a pot of, uh, within that pie chart, there's a pot of money that goes to the state roads. Uh, there's an allocation that goes to municipalities. There's an allocation that goes to townships um, and so on and so forth. But the allocation that comes ultimately back to the county engineers um, is what it is and, and it's divided evenly. Whereas the vehicle registrations, that is a population base number where the more, the more registrations you have, i.e. the bigger county you might have, the more, the, the more revenue you would get from that. And so that's why it's a, in our particular case, it's a 70-30 split. Some counties, more urban counties, I think you're gonna see that 70-30, 80-20 split. Um, the more uh, rural counties, it might be, you know, probably a 50-50 split between gas tax and vehicle registration. Um, so we, O2, uh, we, there was a, uh, we saw the effects of the increase uh, in 2017, uh, the Ohio House authorized uh, Ohio to increase their registration fees um, some, what is that, 15 years later um, to, uh, to, do, to, to, to make this uh, a increase in motor vehicle fees. Uh, we went through the process in uh, July of last year and effective in uh, 2019, we are beginning to see those revenues come in, which um, we expect to be um, around a million dollars. And you, you've mentioned the O2 time frame was the, it, 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 until this last $5 license plate permissive right. fee increase, the O2, just to go back a little yep. bit there, um, O2, the $5 was set aside specifically for bridge repair. We had 393 bridges in Claremont County, 157 of those bridges were restricted. Right. And the numbers that are actually associated with that resolution show that that uh, money that was being generated over a five year period was gonna result in about $15 million worth of bridge projects. Any, where are we with those bridges today? Did, did we get all those under restrictions we, off? Did we? we, we we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, okay. we, we're, we're, um, today, we, I've got some information. We can certainly uh, talk more about that um, as far as that goes. And, and I think that yeah. was about at the time about $850,000. I think documentation I looked at over a five-year period was going to be used to leverage $15 million worth of repairs right. on 82 bridges. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the actual... Um, the, the language that was in back in 01 was certainly, it was an increase in the fees, which, which would be allocated to the, obviously statutorily from permissive fees come back to the engineer's office to allocate, you know, for roads and bridges. And the, the specific target that, that money was gonna be used for. So I wanna, uh, this, is a, this is a finer point, but the, the point is, is that the money was, to, was not, it was allocated to the engineer's office because that's part of the funding. And the funding was to be used for road and bridge projects. The intent that the county engineer had at the time, my predecessor, 
was that it would use it for road and bridges, but it's not to be, it wasn't restricted only to bridges, is the point well, I wanted well, to make. One, well, in one of the things that I wanted to bring up in there is that it was, and the fact that it was even mandated to the auditor of state that it was to be accounted for separately, and it was to have its own account tracking. Well, that was because of the statutory, the ORC section of the code, but, um, and again, I, okay. I, we, we can we can talk about that um, as we go through. Um, it, but I think some of the points that I want to make. I think the resolution of the county commissioner specified bridges that is where that additional tax would be allocated. Okay. So, all right, it wasn't necessarily so, the state law; it was the county resolution. So let's talk about vehicle registration revenues. A um, couple takeaways on this slide is we've got um, revenues going back from the last time that the vehicle, uh, so the, the, the actual legislation was, was put in place in 01, and so the revenues that we saw started in, in 2002. So this graph shows kind of a historic picture of where we're at from 02 to 2018. And I would say the, the major takeaways that I see on this chart are 17 years and we're at the same base rate in terms of revenue being collected per vehicle. And that the only reason why we've seen any increase at all is because we have simply we have more registrations in 2018, almost 45,000 more registrations than we did in 2002. So obviously safety is number one when it comes to roads and bridges. Uh, but the other major component that my office is involved with on a day to day to basis is economic development. So it's sort of ironic because the better job we do on an economic standpoint begets more people to the county. But for 17 years, I, we, we saw no increase into the base rate that those thousands of people that were using the roads and bridges and and the cost of services over 17 years this is 70 percent of my revenue so so the important thing to understand is i have a revenue source that represents 70 percent of my revenue it hasn't been increased in over 17 years and we were able to still progress and do and keep up did we fall behind absolutely but we've done, I think, an incredible job combating the fact that we've gone 17 years with our major revenue source. I can't even begin to think what you know some other operations might feel that how they would deal with that through that reality that a major revenue source would be flat or no increase in the base for 17 years. Um, so anyway, we're we're um, we are where we're at. We're thankful that. Um, there are, there have been uh, recent increases, um, but the reality of 17 years falling every year, we fall further and further behind because these, the structure that we're dealing with, is inherently flawed because there's no indexing, there's no cost escalating factors, there's there's none of that, and so we're challenged to deal with essentially the same amount of money over decades, but yet we're still trying to deal with you know a, an ever growing system and maintain that system so we talk about uh, the permissive fees and a lot of this is sort of um, a lot of things that we talked about uh, last summer uh, when we were talking about increasing the uh, permissive fees uh, so those fees began collections in, in 2019 it's estimated to uh, bring in a, a million dollars as a result, um, the first quarter numbers are in, and it's tracking more like 900,000, so not quite a million. Um, obviously, it was pledged for the road improvement program, which the major component of that is the resurfacing program. Um, and as a result of this additional revenues, um, it's expected to reduce our paving cycle from what was 38 years down to 22 which is still nowhere near what we need, but it was all we had, all the state of Ohio made available to the counties to, uh, to put in place uh, last, last summer. 
And so when you look at our 400 plus miles of road in Claremont County, um, there's a deficit of $2 million to uh, get those uh, roads on a paving cycle that would match up with uh, what we would consider to be industry standard. So we'll move on to gas tax. Quite not really sure what to say about this slide. Um, it's one thing when I have 70% of my revenue, no increase for 17 years, and then you couple that with the fact that you have a 30% revenue source actually decreasing. So we, we have $2.3 million came in in 06, and we have about $10,000 less money that we received last year. Um, it's clearly not population. If you go back a couple slides, we've got 40, almost 45,000 more registrations. It's not population, um, and it's not an accounting error. Um, the reality is, is that the, the, the two, twofold, you know, to go, we're in our 14th year of, of, of 28 cent gas tax. So we've gone 13 years with no base increase to the gas tax, to 30% of our revenue source, uh, and it's actually decreased. It's not flat, it's negative. Um, this is a state only. Obviously, there's a gas tax that's collected federally, but we're talking about revenues that come out of uh, the state of Ohio. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm at a loss, quite frankly, uh, with this one. Uh, if, if this is not an indication that, you know, the, 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 the funding mechanism, again, go back to the fundamental assumption and perception that there is an adequate amount of money allocated from the resources that, that Joe taxpayer pays to fund our roads and bridges, this is, you know, we can, we could probably argue over the word adequate and sufficient amount of money, but if you go 14 years and you're, and you're less revenue, so talk about this upcoming gas tax increase, um, albeit maybe a day late and a dollar short. Um, it's here and it's what we have to work with. I'm, I'm generally a glass half full guy. So um, while I think it's, it's, it's healthy to understand how we got to where we're at um, so we can try to uh, move forward and fix these, these issues or, or certainly deal with these issues, uh, we're certainly very grateful. But again, um, this 1.5 million is, a, is an expected number. We'll hope, we're hopeful that, that we'll hit that number um, but the biggest issue is that again, it's, there's no index. And so while we sit here today in 2019 and say, this is great, 1.5 million, history has proven to me that this issue, unless something major happens, is not going to get revisited for another 10 to 15 years. I mean, that's, that's just the track record of the, of the legislatures that are in charge of this. So we have to deal with, again, a flat, hopefully at least a flat. I mean, if, we're, if we continue to go negative, I just, I, I don't know what we're gonna do. And so um, while this is not intended to give a, a super deep dive on our bridges, Commissioner Painter, um, there are a few facts that are, are, are important and relative. We have 40, over 40% 40 of our bridges are over 50 years old, which is the uh, standard useful life uh, for bridges. We have 416 bridges. We got them, uh, 45 of them have a load restricted. Um, and so, you know, coupled along with the bridge program, we have other things to do and, and, to, and to manage within our road program. And, and one of the issues that's probably the most notable is our, is our susceptibility to landslides with our topography that exists in Claremont County. And currently we have 13 roadways that are being uh, affected currently by landslides. So if you look at the, the additional revenue needed uh, on an annual basis, and again, this isn't 2019 dollars. This is not indexed or um, any kind of number like that. We're looking at three million to replace uh, our deficient bridges and to deal with our landslide situation. So kind of wrapping, 
rounding third and heading for home here. Um, you know, we two and a half million for our road and another two and a half million in today's dollars for our bridge program. So the million and a half that we have additionally coming in um, is is going to help. Don't get me wrong, but it's it's only it's only partially what we need. Um, and when I look at the road program and the bridge program, while we made good strides to get the road program from tw from 38 to 22, you know, my bridge program, when I look at those two, someone, it may not be convenient, it may not be the greatest thing to drive on a, say, a pothole filled road, but, I, but when I compare that over the safety of the motoring public with bridges, and we had recent, a recent failure of a bridge, um, you know that the the additional million dollars is going to be allocated you know again to deal with our bridge program so that leaves us you know short um, you know several million dollars so as far as you know as far as um, you know next steps moving forward um, you know obviously I think we've shown a pretty strong case for the, the need for additional revenue um, just to try to keep pace with 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 inflation and and the cost. I mean, and again, I, I I I don't know what the number is. I know it's not zero, and I know it's not negative in terms of a percent increase. You know, per year, um, we could argue about you know what is appropriate and what's adequate. Some counties have added road levies county road levy I know Miami Township just did a township road levy some counties have allocated portion of their sales tax for highway um, highway improvements uh, don't quite know what the answer is um, I, I know that the system that we have is fundamentally flawed and um, we while we have a little uptick as we sit here today in 2019 every year that goes by um, you know, and we're, 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 we, we see it. We see it in the bids. We see it in our estimates. We see it in our um, cost of goods and services. So um, I don't know if there's any, um, you know, I guess one last thing I would say relative to, you know, all of this, you know, this assumption that adequate funding, and there, there is a responsibility on the office holders that, that are receiving that money, that they're properly spending that and being efficient. Um, I'd be happy to answer, you know, questions, but I know one of the things that comes up quite a bit is, well, what's your payroll look like over that time frame? And I can tell you that since I've been in office, we're down uh, 11 people. Uh, we've we've re reduced the force by 11 people. Um, and uh, this was a slide from the previous, one of the previous, uh, uh, this is information from a slide, but in 05 our payroll was 3.6 million and in 2017 it was 4.3 which represents slightly over one per one and a half percent increase over that uh 13 year period and what's so, the total budget of the operation is it 11 million it's around 10 you know our it's around 10 million yeah and so we've i've done everything in my power to control costs um i can't you know, uh, in terms of expenses, control expenses, um, and we've done everything. But I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm out of tricks. I'm out of options. Uh, I'm nothing up my sleeve, in terms of of leveraging dollars. Seventeen years for seventy percent of my revenue is 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 a is a is a big ask, and we've been able to do it. I know we got great staff. They've been uh, wonderful very creative thinkers, very bright minds. Um, but um, it's, a, it's a real problem, it's a real issue. Um, so I mean, obviously, we're advocating for additional funding. And I know there's been some talk and some discussion about potentially repealing some things. Um, that quite frankly would be devastating if, if that were to happen. Um, and, well, and those numbers, those numbers would you know, we would the, you would see the, all those numbers that we're improving on with just all of the ground, all the legwork, all the uh, progress that we made. We would take you know giant steps backwards. And that was one of the reasons, Pat, that we asked you to come over and talk to us because we did we did have that discussion. The discussion really surrounded about 
when we did the five dollar license plate fee we didn't know that they were going to come right behind it with the gas tax with everything that you've said here today um what's the path forward i, I mean let's just get it right out there on the table we're not going to get any more money states right. aren't going to get any more do we stop funding the tid and we use that money to fix the roads in claremont county i mean what do we do i mean we can't we can't continue to lobby lobby tax to the taxpayers of Claremont County and then not fix the roads. And, and my concern is that we need to fix these roads. I think, um, Pat, answer that or you want to. Oh, you can share it to your comments. The, the real problem is that sitting here today, the money looks good and we'll be able to do a lot of good things with it. But as you know, uh, Commissioner Painter, in 10 years with no indexing, where, where are we going to be? That's, that's the real hurdle. So it's, it's, not, it's not a question of what can we do, it's how long can we do it, you know? And you know, as Pat mentioned, the legislature 10 years is gonna to have to revisit. Well, and let's talk, let's the, talk about, before before the five years. Let's, let's talk yeah. about what the state did. You know, is that our path forward? The state stopped doing projects, you know, and they backed off and they put their money against, you know, the road repair. I mean, we, well, we typically as commissioners put what, a million dollars, Suki, a million three? We have a commitment of a million three, and a majority of that right now is coming from the red. Right. We, we put a million three into the TID. I know you take a million dollars out of your budget. Miami Township puts 500,000 in. Um, I think Union so, Township so, puts 100. Right. I mean, that's our shortfall. So, that's so, the money right. that'll get the roads fixed. To me, where it really comes back to is that as a fundamental question, and debate that we have over adequate. If 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 folks and I'm not disagreeing that there's a limit to what, but I think to me if 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 folks understood that that the current funding mechanism, I mean I'm not I'm not disregarding any amount of tax that are, they're currently paying. And I know no one wants to talk about additional additional increases in, in fees or taxes user fees or whatever you want to call them but the reality is is that those two sources they're it and i don't think most people would if they fully understood the facts could could correlate and can reconcile in their mind that going 13 14 17 years without an increase is 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 a recipe for something that's going to work so to me i mean again to me we gotta we gotta deal with there's there's, there's there, you're you're really getting back to the issue is what, what do we do right. do we do we sit back and do we just do we stay the path with knowing that in five or ten years that we're going to be right back into this problem or do we do like what some other counties have done and and go and go above and beyond um but 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 communicate that and and acknowledge what it is what our problem is because I mean I understand that general public doesn't want just to increase fees taxes user fees just because but I think this is a pretty compelling problem it's a pretty pretty compelling situation that we're dealing with in terms of of re it's, a, it's 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 not you know it's a revenue problem it's not it's not a spending problem but it's we a revenue have to problem. also we have to also understand if the fed raises gas tax and and they're talking about they, they are they that are happens again that's not going to make it any easier for us to get it no 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 none of, none of these increases that because you know what happens is is that they kick the can down until it can't be kicked any further and then they make an increase, which again, 10, 10 and a half cents is not an insignificant increase. But when you when you correlate that back to fourteen years, it's nowhere near what you know. I think me just take my engineer hat off and put the Claremont County taxpayer hat on. I certainly would rather pay a user fee that would go up, you know, incrementally over the years versus you know you wait until it's a it's just a disaster. And then all of a sudden now there's a, a fairly large, you know, increase and, and you and you would and you would really know, and you probably will notice it. Um, so I think we've got, like you said, I think in the short term, um, you know, the additional revenue is going to help, you know, in the next, you know, five years, we're going to see a lot of, of we're going to see that 
that delta. We're going to make some headway. But if, if something isn't changed in the next three to five years, then all of the headway that we made is going to be dissipated with cost increases and, 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 and inflationary factors, and we're going to be right back where we're at. I mean, I think I know for a fact that the committee that looked at state gas tax and what the recommendation was, it was way more than 10.5 cents. Um, that's what they settled on. And I understand it's a political world that we live in. Um, and I know the goal was uh, more of a long-term fix, which is challenging for, for politics to do a long-term fix because they want to show progress during their time frame. Um, and so, you know, the hope is that they'll, they'll honor their word and that this is a, you know, I think the governor was looking for a 10-plus 10, 10 year fix. That's why that was a higher number. And so I think we're at, you know, five to, you know, inside 10 years um, is what they would hope to come back and revisit this. Whether they do or not is yet to be seen. So, um, so we can certainly talk about some of these other things. I know they're, they're it's, it's, you're right, it's an additional burden on, but I don't know what other choice we have. We, we, either, we either try to deal with some things on our own and make the situation better for the folks of Claremont County, or we don't. The way I see it is we've got a bump. We've got $2.4 million. Part of that's 1920. Right. Sure, we'll get 2.4. Sure. And so we're going to end up catching up a lot, I think, on bridges and roads. Uh, but uh, as we go out, we'll be in the same right. situation we are now, right. 10 or 20 years from now. Um, the other thing is, I think the Transportation Improvement District is very important, and we probably shouldn't stop funding it. I would agree. Because it helps us with economic development. We can't expect economic development without improving our roadways. And generally, the county engineer's role is to maintain what we right. got. Correct. Don't add stuff extra. Correct. And I think the Transportation Improvement District has allowed us to add special new things uh, that really have enhanced economic development. So uh, I think we've got a, a bump coming. Right. Uh, and we'll be catching up a lot, but uh, as we get further out, It'll be less, it'll, we'll be back in the situation we're in now. We, we were in Correct. prior to this. <clears throat> well, and, and I think your comments were absolutely correct, Commissioner Humphrey. I mean, the fact that, you know, economic development obviously drives, you know, transportation drives the economic development of any, any county. You know, we all get that. But by the same token, you know, I mean, some of the information that you presented here today shows that, you know, we have increased in bridges. You know, we had 393, now we have 416. You know, we have increased in miles of road that we take care of. Everything we build, we have to take care of. And there just comes a time when, you know, I'm, I see the rock in the hard spot. I mean, what do you do? You know, is it um, <clears throat> looking to the taxpayers? That's probably not gonna be there. You, you manage with what you got. And if you're putting money into another area, you gotta look at that, you know? Uh, just to follow up on uh, what Commissioner Humphrey said, today the TID has built $160 million worth of improvements to the mm -hmm. infrastructure. 65% of that is federal and state grants that we were really only able to get because of that funding source. Right. And when you look at Ohio, we're a donor state when it comes to federal gas tax. In other words, what we pay and give to Washington 100% doesn't come back to Ohio. Mm -hmm. So the best way for us as a county federal dollars was through the TID. And you could easily make the argument that 50 to $60 million that we got over the last 10 years, we wouldn't have been able to. Right. So that's a big, uh, good a point. Big plus right. TID. We get more of our money back that way. Because we wouldn't be able to do it. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other conversation or comments? Good. <coughs> Thanks, Pat. Thanks, Greg. We will move on with the agenda. I understand we have a presentation on the 2020 census briefing.
which is important to us. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, I need some assistance. Touch B for black, and that'll bring up his slides again, probably. And then we can switch to yours. That's his. Suki, We have assistance coming your way. <laughs> Stand by. <laughs> Screen. Oh. Yep. a pretty picture, was it? No. no? I'll just yeah, do so. make it larger. What do you do? Yeah, all right, so we'll just move forward. Um, so good, I guess, morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Lauren Taylor. Thank you so much for having me, uh, commissioners. Mm -hmm. I am a partnership specialist with the U.S. Census Bureau, and I um, work specifically with Hamilton and Claremont County. And so my goal today is to give you all an overview of the 2020 census, um, which is just around the corner, and share some ways in which you can support um, the work that we're trying to do. Anywhere is it? Mm -mm. <laughs> got arrows? <All> right. <laughs> Very bottom. Is this a PDF or a PowerPoint? I'm trying to close it so I can open it up with the correct version. I'll just plant it over here. Huh? That's what I meant. <laughs> numbers. Hi, Debbie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Here we go. Um, so first, let's start with some quick background on the U.S. Census. So the U.S. Constitution actually requires a census of the population every 10 years, and so that's a count of every person in the United States. So it's a major, major operation. Um, it was actually first conducted in 1790. Um, at the time, the count was 3.9 million people, 
and federal marshals on horseback actually went around and were responsible for counting every person. So since then, obviously the census methods have evolved um, have and have continued to change over time. So it went from just being able to respond via mail to having a telephone response option to now in 2020 being the first time where folks will be able to respond online. Um, and most importantly, census results are important and are used in various ways. So I'm sure many of you, you know, probably already know um, that census results are used to determine how many congressional seats each state gets in the House of Representatives. It's um, the data are used by states to draw legislative districts, school districts, and determine voting precincts. Um, census data are used to uh, allocate federal funds to states and local governments. And overall, census data are regularly used by governments and businesses to inform planning and decision making. So this slide here just shows how the 2010 census results impacted congressional seats. So you can see that Ohio lost two seats in 2010, and there's a potential for the state to lose another seat after the 2020 census. So this is why ensuring we have a complete and accurate count is important, because our representation matters. And so for even more uses of census data, many people may not realize how census data can impact their everyday lives. Census results are used to determine how over $675 billion in federal funds are distributed annually. So these are funds for things like transportation and parks, social service programs like SNAP, WIC, and housing. It's used to determine, fund determine funding amounts for pre-K, um, Head Start, school lunch programs, and the funds are also used for healthcare services like EMTs and community clinics. And really this list it's a massive list, it goes on. So there's definitely is at least one way these results could impact your life. And so what does this mean for the state of Ohio specifically? Uh, George Washington University conducted a survey, a study, to estimate how much federal funding each state could lose for every person that's not counted. Um, this was based on data from 16 of the largest federal assistance programs that use census-derived statistics. And so for Ohio, that number is $1,814 per person per year. So think about it. If 100 people in your community are not counted, that's $181,400 of federal funds the community could miss out on. But remember that census numbers are used for 10 years. So over a 10-year span, that's $1,814,000. Um, so it's really important for us to get this right, bottom line. And so there are certain groups that, for various reasons, have been hard to count historically. These groups, um, some of them are listed here, and I'm sure we could all list a number of reasons or factors that contribute to these groups being undercounted. For example, it could be language barriers, lack of knowledge about what the census is, or even fear. And so it's important to note that the information collected by the Census Bureau is only used to produce statistics. It's actually illegal for the Census Bureau to disclose or publish any personally identifiable information. And um, every Census Bureau employee, including myself, takes a lifetime oath not to release any of that information. And if we were to do so, it's actually a federal crime. Um, so we work with local partners and trusted community voices to reach these groups. Um, and overall, we just want partners to spread the message that the census is easy, safe, and important. And so sorry that map is a little hard to see, but uh, one tool available to partners on the census website is something we call ROAM, which stands for Response Outreach Area Mapper. This map pulls together data from different census surveys and gives each census tract a low response score. So it shows what percentage of the population is unlikely to respond. And so this is a tool that community partners can use when planning outreach or promotion efforts leading up to 2020. So this is a screenshot of Claremont County, um, and the darker the color, the higher the low response score. And so zooming in, um, if you click on a certain census tract, Rome will show you characteristics or demographics of that population. This may give you further information in addition to whatever local knowledge you have of what groups or communities should be a focus of outreach. And this is not to say that you should only focus on the darker areas, but maybe, you know, pour more resources into those, in, into those areas. Um, and these aren't necessarily, these demographics are not necessarily meant to be uh, pre perfect predictors, but could give some insight. So here I just highlighted that, once again, kind of small, but uh, 
Almost 52% of the population are renters in this area and 21% of the households have children under six. So renters, for example, may not respond for a variety, re variety of reasons. Maybe there are more people living there than there are listed on the lease. And then we know that young children are historically undercounted in the census. So it's interesting to just go into Rome and, and click around and, and see what you find. So focusing in now on 2020. So census day is April 1st, 2020. The goal of the 2020 census is to count everyone once, only once, and in the right place. And we are really working to ensure that we get a complete and accurate count. So there are a few new features um, of the 2020 census that I want to highlight. Uh, for 2020, we'll be launching a robust outreach campaign using traditional media and new media outlets to ensure that everyone sees census messaging. And as I mentioned, 2020 will be the first year where people will have the option to respond online. And we are really encouraging people to do that. Um, and overall for 2020, we are utilizing automated systems for all aspects of census operations to increase efficiency and save taxpayer dollars. And so this slide uh, gives an overview of some of the various elements involved in the 2020 census design. First, we established where to count. So this means ensuring we have an up-to-date address list. Then we want to increase the response to the 2020 census by motivating people to respond. And we do this essentially through the nationwide communications and partnership campaign. We work with trusted voices to maximize outreach and increase awareness. Um, and as your partnership specialist, my goal is to really help you get the word out to your community. So the next column is counting the population. We make it easy for people to respond, as I already mentioned, online, on the phone, through mail, or if you don't respond through any of those options, someone will show up at your door. Um, the survey is short and it only takes about 10 minutes. And then finally, the census results are released. Are released. And this is um, a timeline of all those different operations. So looking at the timeline and where we are now, over the past few months, the partnership specialists have started reaching out to local governments and key partners. Um, in August, we'll begin the address canvassing operation, which is essentially where census employees will be out checking the address list, partic particularly addresses that we weren't able to confirm by any other um, data source. So you may see people out and about during this time conducting those checks. We are um, planning to open area census offices, which I'll show a map of. In March of 2020, the invitation to respond to the census will go out across the nation. And on March 23rd, the online response will open, the online survey will open. Um, Non-response follow-up, so that's when census takers go door to door, will begin in May of 2020. Oops. There we go. Um, so here is um, the plan for the Ohio area 2020 census offices. So there are six regional census offices. Ohio is a part of the Philadelphia region, and there will be eight census offices opening up across the state covering different portions, as you can see there. So Columbus is the only office that's currently open, um, and the rest will be opening this fall. So by this point, I hope you're wondering how you can help us out, how you can support the 2020 census. And I think I've mentioned partnership a number of times, but I just want to emphasize again to collaborate with us, collaborate with us on engagement, on promotion, and on these operations. So for engagement, invite census representatives to meetings and events, like this one here, any opportunity to continue to spread awareness, um, and connect us to others in your network who you think would make a great partner or may be interested in working with the Census Bureau. For promotion, really just encourage your community to participate in the census. And this can take many forms, um, like posting on websites, social media, or including census messaging in local events, like festivals or fairs. A great way to encourage participation is through something we call complete count committees, which I'll touch on in a moment. Um, and lastly, operation. The Census Bureau is hiring thousands of workers across the country specifically for the 2020 census. As jobs become available in your community, you can promote these jobs. Our goal um, is to hire locally. And since many of these positions are remote, meaning folks work from their home, uh, we'll be looking for space to conduct testing and training. Consider if you have a space like a community center or a library that you would be willing to let us use. Um, and so these are just a few ways to collaborate and we're definitely open to hear any ideas you may have as well. And so complete count committees are volunteer committees established by local governments or community leaders. This was an initiative that started um, in, with the 2010 census and they found that CCCs as they call, they're called 
were key to increasing response rate by spreading awareness and motivating communities to respond. So we're encouraging governments and communities to establish a CCC to increase the response rate. And so these briefly just four steps for establishing a complete count committee. So first you would identify a chair, the members and maybe subcommittees depending on the size. Each CCC would determine which groups should be represented on the committee based on you know, their local knowledge. Um, the second step is to host a training for the uh, committee members. So the training is conducted by a census rep, probably me. Um, it provides an overview of the 2020 census, really does a deep dive and just make sure that the members are knowledgeable about the census and are confident to go out and continue to spread that message. The third step would be for the committee to host a planning meeting, a series of planning meetings to develop a work plan. And so this work plan is really just establishing the goals, identifying those hard to count populations and developing a plan to promote the census that is tailored to the unique characteristics of their community. Um, and then the final step is just really implementing that plan. So the CCC would implement the outreach activities that they've identified leading up to 2020 with the goal of increasing awareness. Um, a partnership specialist would serve as a liaison between the CCC and the Census Bureau, providing guidance and answering any questions that may come up. But the local government or community group is, has complete ownership of the CCC. So whatever they want to do is totally up to them. And so this image here, this is a, an example of a government-led CCC, but really it's just an example, not anything set in stone. Um, it could be broad or more narrow in focus, completely up to you. Perhaps there's an existing task force or coalition that could serve as a CCC, and they could add 2020 to their agenda or their current projects. We just encourage groups to consider having diverse representation to make sure a variety of perspectives are at the table. And it does not have to be a lot of work. CCCs are really just kind of an official vehicle, an official way of mobilizing community resources to make sure community members are informed and in turn more likely to respond to the census. And so we're just encouraging people to get started now. I keep saying 2020 is around the corner. It may seem like it's far, it's not. Um, so we want folks to prepare now by identifying resources that they wanna to use to promote um, the census, coordinate with other groups and organizations in your area, CCCs are forming now across the state and the nation, um, and trainings are being scheduled. And remember that partnership specialists like myself are here to help. Um, it's really up to all of us to educate and motivate our constituents, our colleagues, our friends, our neighbors to respond to the census. Um, so we encourage you to become a 2020 census partner and help us achieve a complete and accurate count. And so really briefly, I just wanna go over some available resources that we have on our website. Um, there are a number of fact sheets, toolkits, infographics, social media graphics, all things that I can provide to you if you're interested. Um, these things can be shared through community organizations, in newsletters, on social media, really anywhere that would get the word out. And I also want to mention that we have um, recruiting assistants that can attend job fairs or even host job application workshops where they can help folks apply for those census jobs that I mentioned. And then if you're just really into data, and want to know more about census data uh, from any of the surveys that the Census Bureau administers and how it could be useful to any of your work or planning. There are different uh, data trainings available online as well as being able to connect with um, a data expert. So, um, you know, become a 2020 census partner. Uh, here's some contact information. I also have my cards available if anyone wants to chat. Um, I have our social media sites listed here so you can connect with us and you can always learn more um, at census.gov 2020 census. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Taylor, you did an excellent job. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank I, you for uh, having me. I didn't think that, you know, census data and learning about a census could be exciting, but you, I you try. Exciting <laughs> census, so. Well, Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Any questions from the okay. board about no, just leave us some cards if you okay. would, please. Thank I you. I will. Uh, cards. And I also have some Census 101 fact sheets if anyone wants Great. to take. I'll leave it over here. Okay. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you all. <clears throat> Item number E, public participation. If there's anyone here today in attendance who would like to participate who's a member of the public, the time is available to do so. You can participate by raising your hand and letting us know that you'd like to address the board and then move to the podium, state your name and address. Is there anyone that would like to participate? 
Seeing none, we'll move forward with item number F, the consent agenda. <clears throat> Board of consent agenda has been prepared for you. I know you have had it in draft form as of Friday, had ample time to review and have any questions that you might have addressed. Uh, do I have a motion to consider the consent agenda for approval? I'll make that motion. Second. It's been moved and seconded. <clears throat> Roll call, Judy. Mrs. Corcoran. Yes. Mr. Humphrey. Aye. Mr. Painter. Yes. We'll now move to item G, the non-consent agenda, starting on page three. Recommendation of the Board of Claremont County Commissioners and item six, adopt resolution number 047-19, resolving to approve payment to vendors in the amount of $1,870,171.61, as set forth in the BCC approval invoice report for checks dated May 1, 2019, BCC directed prepaid invoices, procurement card transition report presented by the county auditor on 429, and further authorizing the county auditor to issue warrants for the same pursuant to section 319.16 of the Ohio Revised Code. Do I have a motion to consider approval for item six? So moved. I'll second the motion. Then moved and seconded. Any further conversation or need for clarification? Roll call, Judy. Humphrey. Aye. Worker. Yes. Amy? Yes. Item number seven. <laughs> Morning. Morning. Nikki McClure with Job and Family Services um, here in regards to the Department of Job and Family Services Second Amendment to the Industrial Building Lease Agreement with the First Industrial Investment to LLC. Relative to the lease for of space for the Southwest Ohio Regional Training Center for the same, which is item 13-0827-002. It's the recommendation of Judy Eshman, Director, Department of Job and Family Services, with the concurrence of Thomas J. Eigel, County Administrator, to, exec to execute the Second Amendment to the Industrial Building Lease Agreement by and between the Board of County Commissioners, Claremont County, Ohio, on behalf of the Claremont County Department of Job and Family Services, the administrative entity and fiscal agent for the Southwest Ohio Regional Training Center, or known as SWORTSE, and First Industrial Investment to LLC, whose corporate office is located at 311 South Wacker Drive, Chicago, Illinois, previously ratified by the Board of County Commissioners on September 11, 2013, through an industrial building lease assignment agreement by and between Claremont County, Ohio and Butler County, Ohio for the re lease of office space located at 420 Wards Corner Road, Suite J, Loveland, Ohio 45140 to be utilized by Swartzy employees and subsequently extended for an additional three-year term effective through April 30th, 2019 by the First Amendment thereto ratified by the Board of County Commissioners on March 9th, 2016 with said am Second Amendment to the Industrial Building Lease Agreement to extend the agreement for an additional three-year term effective for the period of May 1st, 2019 through April 30th, 2022. With all other terms and conditions set forth in the original Industrial Building Lease Agreement and Assignment and First Amendment thereto to remain in full force in effect except as expressly modified by or consistent with the terms of the Second Amendment thereto. Board, you've heard the reading of item number seven. Do I have a motion for consideration? I'll make that motion. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further conversation or discussion? And we will pause just a moment for a roll call. I don't think we've ever experienced this. Mm -hmm. I don't think we have. I can do the roll call. Ms. Corcoran? Yes. Mr. Humphrey? Aye. Mr. Painter? Yes. Okay. Thank you. We did the roll Item call. Item number eight. Which one? <coughs> one seven. Mm -hmm. Claire. Made the Claire made the motion. Oh, Claire made the motion. Ed second. Ed second. Ed made the roll call. <laughs> Good for Edward. I knew he'd know how to do it. Item number eight. Good morning, Brandon Hepner, uh, director of ISD. Uh, it's, my or it's my recommendation with the concurrence of Thomas J. Eigel, county administrator, to authorize David L. Painter, president of the Board of County Commissioners, to execute the Spectrum Customer Service, Agree Service Order 11002399, buying between Claremont County, Ohio, and Charter Communications, LLC, 
in concert with the Spectrum, Sur Spectrum Enterprise Service Agreement for the provisions of TV services, voice services, fiber internet access services, Ethernet services, internet services, and managed Wi-Fi services for Claremont County agencies, departments, and offices previously ratified by the Board of County Commissioners on 2-25-2019 uh, with said customer service order to provide coax internet and phone services for the Felicity Wastewater Treatment Plant located at 771 Panther Road, Felicity, Ohio at the rate of $124.98 per month for internet services and $34.99 per month for phone services plus applicable <laughs> regulatory fees and 49.50 one-time internet charge of the service fee pursuant to and in compliance with the terms and conditions set forth in the four statement spectrum enterprise service agreement board you've heard the reading of item number eight do i have a motion for consideration so moved i'll second the motion it's been moved and seconded any further conversation or discussion roll call judy mr humphrey aye mrs corcoran yes mr Payne. yes item number nine recommendation of myself with concurrence of thomas j Igo, county administrator to modify the 2019 rate schedule for the internet service fund entitled the telecommunications division Heretofore established by the Board of County Commissioners on 123-2019, effective 1-1-2019, uh, to reflect the necessary changes for services and equipments to recover incremental cost from the users of the system. For additional deletions, modifications thereto, and outlined therein, effective 1-1-2019, as follows. Board, you've heard the reading of item number nine. Uh, do I have a motion for consideration? I'll make that motion. Second. Been moved and second. Any further conversation or discussion? Roll call, Judy. Mrs. Corcoran? Yes. Mr. Humphrey? Aye. Mr. Painter? Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Brandon. Item number 10. Morning. Morning, Mr. Kiskaden. I'm John Kiskaden, Director of the Department of Public Safety Services. On my recommendation with the concurrence of Thomas J. Igo, County Administrator, to authorize the establishment of a staff de development and continuing education program for the full-time employees of the Claremont County Department of Public Safety Services to include classes offered by the Association of Professional Communication Operators, known as APCO, through an online training website and to further authorize expenditures for the classes at the rate of $379 per class per enrollee not to exceed estimated $6,000 a year, pursuant to the Section 3 25.191 of the Ohio Revised Code and in compliance with the annual appropriations of the calendar year 2019 and any and all amendments subsequent to therefore there too sorry board you've heard the reading of item number 10 do I have a motion for consideration I'll make that motion I'll second the motion Been moved and second any further conversation or discussion roll call Judy Mr. Humphrey aye Mrs. Corcoran yes Container? Yes. Item number 11. Thank you. Thanks, John. Good morning. Good morning. Lily Fry, the director of the Claremont County Adult Probation Department, Common Police Court. And I am here with a concurrence of Thomas Eigel uh, for you to uh, approve an addendum to our current contract with um, Brightview Treatment Services for professional services. Um, that we in a nutshell we have a contract with them currently through our medication assisted treatment program for our opiate addicted offenders to uh, receive uh, treatment services on an outpatient basis um, we would like an addendum to be able to provide in jail assessments for our offenders who are currently incarcerated and it is our hope that once we the quicker we provide the treatment services, the assessment services, the quicker we can get them into treatment. And then we'll move them out of the jail and open up beds for other people. So um, the amount represents the addition of an in-jail assessment services at a rate of $111.11 per assessment with no change in the original contract amount of $136,800 
or contract effective dates, therefore with all other terms and conditions of the reference contract for professional services to remain in full force and effect and in concert with the subsidy grant agreement by and between the County of Claremont County, Ohio and the Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections, the Division of Par Parole and Community Services, the Bureau of Community Sanctions, which was previously ratified by the County Commissioners on December 20th of 2017 for uh, the provision of a justice reinvestment and incentive grant for the Claremont County Common Police Court Adult Probation Department. Sounds like a good idea. Mm -hmm. Great idea. Board, you've heard the reading of item number 11. Do I have a motion for consideration? I will absolutely make that motion. Second. It's been moved and second. Any further conversation or discussion? Comments? Roll call, Judy. Scorcoran. Yes. Mr. Humphrey. Aye. Mr. Painter. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Item number 12. Hi. 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 Morning. I'm trying. <laughs> um, every time I get the short version, I, may, I get myself in trouble. Yeah. Uh, I'm Jim Maloney. I'm the administrator to the uh, Sheriff's Office. And uh, this is a recommendation of uh, Robert S. Leahy, Claremont County Sheriff with the concurrence of Thomas J. Eichel, Administrator to um, authorize David L. Painter, President of the Board of County Commissioners, to execute a sub-grant award from the Ohio Department of Public Safety uh, Office of Criminal Justice for funding through the uh, Edward Byrne Memorial Grant number 2018 JG-A01-6250 entitled Claremont County Drug Unit in the amount of $56,250 with a required match of $18,750 for a total of $75,000. For the period of 1119 through 1231 for and on behalf of the county sheriff uh, of the county of Claremont as the designated agency for the administration and implementation thereof pursuant to and in compliance with the terms and conditions set forth herein in conjunction with the Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistant Grant application filed electronically back in May of last year. Um, and the standard assurances and special conditions therefore ratified by the commissioners on 2 13 19. Uh, the JAG grant is becoming a little bit more inconsistent and when we're getting the award it should be uh, starting in January of every year. As I mentioned we apply for it um, the following year in, in May. Uh, as soon as um, we get the award signed uh, we'll be able then to um, <coughs> post our and only pays for salaries we'll post our salaries and then be reimbursed for those until we reach that amount um, the grant itself uh, for example um, this month we're, we'll have to do the new application for the following year so hopefully um, and uh, they'll be a little bit more timely in getting us this, this money uh, otherwise we run off of uh, basically our forfeitures and our other LEF grant that we have. Board, you've heard the reading of item number 12. Do I have a motion for consideration? I'll make a motion to approve item number 12. I'll second the motion. It's been moved and seconded. Any further conversation or discussion? Roll call, Judy. Mr. Humphrey. Aye. Mrs. Corcoran. Yes. Mr. Painter. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Yeah. Item number 13. Hello, Craig Reisner, Claremont County Engineer's Office. Item number 13 is a recommendation of Patrick J. Munger, County Engineer, with the concurrence of Thomas J. Agel, County Administrator, to execute record plat number 6293137 for the replat of lots in the following subdivision located in Miami Township. Um, this is a replat of lots 7 and 8A in Buckwheat Knowles subdivision in Miami Township, and uh, the purpose is to create new lot number 7A. Board, you've heard the reading of item number 13. Do I have a motion for approval? I'll make that motion. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further conversation or discussion? Roll call, Judy. Mrs. Corcoran? Yes. Mr. Humphrey? Aye. Mr. Painter? Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Craig. Item number 14. Hi, Mary Rains. Good morning. Good morning. Mary Rains from the Office of Management and Budget. Item 14 is a renewal of the Office of Education, Educational Service Center lease for space at the Family Service Center. 
Um, it's the first of three renewals approved from the June 18th last year agreement that was signed, and it represents about a 1.84% increase that we'll receive for that space. Uh, Jeff Weir sent a request to renew that agreement back in on March 6th. Um, and uh, it does include a change in the CPI um, that's used. The index that was used previously was the Cincinnati area, and they discontinued that index. So the uh, index that replaced that is the Midwest East North Central region, and we've noted that that's what will be used for this point forward. Board, you've heard the reading of item number 14 to, for renewal of the lease agreement between Claremont County Education Service Center for the lease of space located at 2400 Claremont Center Drive. Do I have a motion for approval? I make a motion to approve the lease. I'll second the motion. It's been moved and seconded. Any further conversation or discussion? Roll call, Judy. Mr. Humphrey. Aye. Mrs. Corcoran. Yes. Mr. Painter. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Yes. Item number 15. Commissioners, item 15 is reauthorizing the county administrator to uh, sign documents on behalf of the board. So I'll have to defer to uh, Ms. Kosika for reading of the motion. A resolution has been prepared with the exhibits of the uh, referenced uh, standard contracts that we've been using for years. Um, this is an opportunity for um, not only the county administrator to execute these for and on behalf of the Board of County Commissioners, but also the in his absence. Um, and as directed, the assistant county administrator to execute them. Um, it's with qualified vendors, contractors, and professionals as selected and recommended by responsible county by the responsible county office. It's to perform limited work services for costs less than fifty thousand dollars, under the supervision of said office for those maintenance, repairs, and improvements to county facilities, equipment, and property, and that the um, county administrator or assistant county administrator shall ensure that all the contractual documents are complete and the scope of services outlined are consistent with the appropriations for the project and the plans and specifications developed for that project, and that members of the Board of County Commissioners will be provided with a report on a regular basis of all contracts executed by either of them and further to approve changes to those contracts and agreements uh, as identified and attached but it is to include the clause that quote the owner may terminate the contract for the owner's convenience at any time unquote with such changes to be communicated by the administration to all county department heads and elected officials for implementation effective this date um, in the past the uh, board um, and and this has uh, been evolving but the most recent is that all contracts of fifty thousand dollars and under are signed by the county administrator with those uh, um, reaching twenty five thousand and and to fifty are brought back for ratification by the board of county commissioners in consultation with the prosecuting attorney's office and the overall fact that there is no uh, rescinding of those contracts that you had already authorized by that action um, they have um, um, indicated that they will be submitting a report to you on a regular basis <coughs> that indicates those and that they'll have copies of them um, and that they will not be coming back to you for ratification and only those contracts 50,000 in excess for these specific issues will be brought before the Board of County Commissioners for consideration and ratification it does mean that prior um, that all those contracts of less than 50,000 will be able to proceed without coming before the Board of County Commissioners and whatnot, but it does not mean that they will not be reviewed and approved by the prosecuting attorney, respectively. Yeah, and, a lot of, and <clears throat> those contracts from 25 to 50,000 are already signed and executed by me. So, um, and a lot of times by the time they get back to the board, they're already comp the projects are complete. Okay. Board, you've heard the reading of item number 15. Do I have a motion for approval? I'll make that motion. I'll second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further conversation or discussion? It makes an awful lot of sense to me to do it this way. Okay. So, And this is not the first time this has been done, right? Um, it, it started off with less amounts. It's, it's gendered around the competitive bidding process. And um, the last time we ratified it was when we had you, Commissioner Painter, join the Board of County Commissioners. And I know that um, Mr. Eigel has been working with the prosecutor's office to come with the appropriate documentation um, uh, upon the um, arrival of uh, Commissioner Corcoran. Well, this, and this was first passed in 2005. 
and that was the original authorization for the county administrator to sign any uh, contracts under twenty five thousand. But it's it, been you modified. started out with five thousand, as I recall, because yeah, that moved was moved up to twenty five and then up to fifty when the bid threshold changed. Right, and, and that's what's driving that fifty thousand cost. Is Correct. The bid threshold. Correct. Contracts under fifty thousand. Okay. <clears throat> Roll call, Judy. Mrs. Corcoran. Yes. Mr. Humphrey. Aye. Mr. Painter. Yes. Item sixteen. Good morning. Morning. Aye. Um, Yvonne Smith, Benefit Plan Coordinator for Clement County. It is my recommendation with the concurrence of Sandy Tahat, Human Resources Administrator, to execute the renewal of the agreement for professional consulting services by and between Clement County, Ohio, and Haran Associates of Cincinnati. Previously ratified by the Board of the County Commissioners on 510 of 2017, and subsequently renewed on 5-2 of 2018 for an additional one year period, effective through 5-31 of 2019, for the provision of professional consulting services relative to Clement County's employee benefits program, with said renewal to extend the agreement for an additional one year term effective 6-1 of 2019 through 5-31 of 2020, which represents the election of the second of two 12-month term extensions, therefore, pursuant to and in compliance with Article 2A of the aforestated agreement with all other terms and conditions of the referenced agreement and renewal, therefore, to remain in full effect. Board, you've heard the reading of item number 16. Do I have a motion for approval? I move that we approve item 16. Second the motion. It's been moved and seconded. Any further conversation or discussion? Roll call, Judy. Mr. Humphrey. Aye. Mrs. Corcoran. Yes. Mr. Painter. Yes. Thank Thanks, you. Yvonne. Item number 17. Hello again. Item 17 is a request to increase the annual appropriation in the uh, Community Transportation Connection Fund other expenses in the amount of $24,288. And it's in a reference to a uh, change order on the buses that they were ordering. Okay. And board, you've heard the reading of item number 17. Do I have a motion for approval? I make that motion. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further conversation or discussion? Roll call, Judy. Mrs. Corcoran? Yes. Mr. Humphrey? Aye. Mr. Payne? Yes. Thank you. Tom, do you have any additions to the agenda? No addition, sir, but there was a item tabled last week on April 24th just, regarding bring that up. the resurfacing program. Didn't know if the board wanted to uh, remove this from the table for reconsideration. Let me remind the board there, um, April, our uh, April 24th meeting, just this past week, we tabled an item. It was the county engineer's request to advertise for bids for project number RS-07-19 relative to the 2019 road resurfacing program located in various townships, 19-0408-009. That item was tabled. Do, would it, is it the board's pleasure to bring it back off the table, back into the session for consideration? If it is, I would accept a motion for that movement. I move, I move that we take it off the table and bring it to the agenda for today. Okay. I'll second the motion. It's been moved and seconded. Any further conversation or discussion about that? Judy, roll call. Mr. Humphrey? Aye. Mrs. Corcoran? Yes. Mr. Painter? Yes. <clears throat> and so now I will add a motion to the agenda. Previously, that was table. And the motion is a county engineer's request to advertise for bids for project number RS-0719 relative to the 2009 road resurfacing program. Uh, associated and located in various townships. It's a recommendation of Patrick J. Monger, County Engineer with the concurrence of Thomas Eigel, County Administrator to approve the request to advertise for bids for project number RS-07-19 relative to the 2019 road surfacing program located in various townships pursuant to the specifications thereof and to authorize the clerk of the board to place a legal notice in the newspaper of general circulation and that date was 5-2. Will that change, Judy? Yes. <clears throat> and it will change to? It would, if you're going to proceed, um, it would be for 5-9 of 
which okay. is on a Thursday at the Claremont Sun, and the opening then would be um, <coughs> two o'clock p.m. on the twenty-third Thursday. Mm -hmm. Thursday the twenty-third in the office of the Board of County Commissioners at one hundred one East Davie, Ohio four five one zero three, where they will be publicly opened and read aloud shortly thereafter. This notice will also be posted in, on the Claremont County's website at the following URL link at www.claremontcountyohio.gov. Board, you've heard the reading of the addition to the agenda today. Do I have a motion for approval? I'll make that motion. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further conversation or discussion? Uh, one discussion point. I just wanted to say thank you to Pat for coming over and explaining his dilemma with the road program and obviously the bridge replacement. Um, there is one change that was uh, included in that, in that um, the um, previous tabled item uh, had an initial submittal for 8.5 miles of resurfacing, 17 miles of repair. Uh, what we are, what has been included in the estimate is 19 miles of resurfacing. He's added 10.5 miles and the 17 miles of repairing stays the same for a total estimate of $2,083,067. Any further conversation or discussion? Roll call, Judy. Mrs. Corcoran? Yes. No, hold on. Oh. We didn't make a motion, did we? Yeah. 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 I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Mrs. Corcoran did. Okay, I'm sorry. That's okay. Mrs. Corcoran? Yes. Mr. Humphrey? Aye. Mr. Painter? Yes. Any other items to come before the board, Tom? Yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> well, obviously, item H, we just talked about additions to the board. We'll move to item number I. I am requesting an executive session pursuant to section 121.22 G1 and G3 of the Ohio Revised Code to first consider the appointment, employment, or compensation of one or more public employees, and two, to confer with the prosecuting attorney regarding pending or imminent litigation, respectively. Do I have a motion to enter into executive session? So moved. I'll second that motion. Been moved and seconded. Roll call, Judy. Mr. Humphrey? Aye. Mrs. Corcoran? Yes. Mr. Painter? Yes. We stand in executive session. We will return and we will conduct further business. Thank you for coming today. <coughs> we are back from executive session. No decisions were made. <coughs> Board, I understand that we have the need to uh, take a recess from this meeting, from regular session. So I would like to ask for a motion to uh, move us from regular session into recess. I'll make that motion. Do we know when we're coming out? We're going to come out at 2 o'clock. Okay. Second. It's, it's been moved and seconded. Any conversation or discussion? Discussion includes that we will recess this meeting until 2 p.m. this afternoon we will con reconvene and we will take further action roll call judy Mrs. corcoran yes mr humphrey aye mr painter yes we stand in recess thank you we are back and i'd like to call this meeting from recess back into regular session board i understand there is a need for us to have an a executive session for further uh, discussion so I would go back to exhibit I and I would ask that we uh, move into executive session pursuant to section 121.22 G3 of the Ohio Revised Code to confer with the prosecuting attorney regarding pending or imminent litigation respectively. Do I have a motion to go into executive session? I'll make that motion. Second. Been moved and seconded. Roll call, Ju <laughs> Roll call Ju uh, Judy. Ms. Mrs. Corcoran? Yes. Mr. Humphrey? Aye. Mr. Painter? Yes. <clears throat> we are moving to executive session. We will uh, return and conduct further business. Thank you. Good. We have returned from executive session. There were no decisions made. And we'll continue with the uh, agenda. We are at item J, county staff elected official discussion. Do we have any elected official discussions today? No, sir. We'll move on to item K for member comments. Board, any comments before we no comments. adjourn this meeting? Nope. No? Well, then I would ask for a motion to adjourn our meeting today of 5-1.
Yes, member comments. I'd encourage everyone to attend the day of prayer tomorrow serv services. Good one. Yep. Good one. Absolutely. That's at the courthouse steps at 12 o'clock. Noon, noon o'clock. Yep. Yep. We're hoping that the rain holds off. <clears throat> if the rain doesn't hold off, then we'll move right around the corner to the Presbyterian Church. And I think that's on 3rd Street, if I remember. So, okay. With that, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll make that motion. Second. It's been moved and second. Roll call, Judy. Mr. Corcoran. Yes. Mr. Humphrey. Aye. Mr. Painter. Yes. Thank you for attending. That concludes our meeting today of the uh, first day of May. That's pretty unbelievable. Wow. Have a great day.